I don't know if it's something you can teach or if ambition is something you can teach. Yeah. It's, I mean, you can nurture, but I don't know if you can just tell someone like, this is why you should be fired up today. Yeah, like listening to David Goggins every day, getting you out of bed, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's you true. Just swear at you or Gary V swear at you all day. <laughs> make make that your alarm. I mean, no, that would but, work for me though. It, I like it, that so, style. Same here, same here. But I think, like, I think you mentioned that the productivity, the the little growth hacks, the little we could almost make a course on this, like the little things you need to do to train yourself, like putting my 10 by two, the 10 people I want to engage with every day into my notes, making their URLs clickable. So when I have to engage with people, it's like, okay, well, this is only going to take me 10 minutes. Let me just open it up. Let me set a reminder to tell me when I'm at lunch to go, you know, respond to these yeah, people. Put Siri to work over yeah, here. Yeah. All these, all these <laughs> little best tricks. Employee. You could literally make a productivity AI bot, like you said, like Siri and come back and just have you get nudged and notified every time you need to do a certain action. The Side Hustlers Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, we break down the art of healthy hustling, getting out of your own way, and growing your creative business. Steven, my man, how are you doing today? It is a pleasure to finally get a chance to eat meet you after all these DMs back and forth. So what's going on? with How are you doing? Oh, we're doing good. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, big fan of the work you're putting out too. So excited to be here. So a little bit of backstory and some context. I've been following your dominant rise on Instagram, I'd say probably about maybe two years now. And what I teach, kind of what we're talking about in the pregame here, was what I teach is grounded in the philosophy of mindset, motivation, and marketing from the perspective of a creative side hustler. And I really felt like your mindset and your concept parallels to what I believe and teach with my students on top of the flock that for caption writing, you know, all of this has been like a staple in my group coaching programs over the last two years. So uh, one, I know my students are really, really hyped to have you on and speak today because we're always plugging your stuff uh, towards brand building and social media growth. And two, I'm just freaking geek to finally get a chance to connect. So for those who may not know with that out of the way, give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself and why people should care. Awesome. Stoked to be here. So I'm Steve Miller and I'm a designer, marketer, sort of side hustler. I like to create products and put them out there. It's definitely, I had like my full-time job, my nine to five. And I always had this inkling to like build on the side, you know, to create on the side. And that's sort of where this all spawned. And it started when I was in a startup doing UI UX, um, creating all the designs. And I decided just to put them up on Instagram. Over time, you know, I really fell in love with growing through Instagram and, you know, connecting with people and all the ins and outs, you know, it's essentially you're building a product and your product is your personal brand. So I took like this whole creator builder aspect and wanted to jump in and see if I could do it at scale. So I just started uh, creating and sharing and then it caught like wildfire. Yeah, I would love to speak toward... The rise. And if you're watching the, the YouTube video version of this, I'm kind of just scrolling through his feed, uh, looking at these drawing Instagram reels, which we'll touch on too. But can you speak towards the rise over the last one, two, and three years and the power that you've had of like niching down into your lane, focusing on here's my interest, here's the topics that I am most passionate about, here's the message I want to relay, here's my perfect person, which then would ripple to a target audience. You know, can you kind of speak toward that? So when I first got into Instagram, like 2016, I did everything wrong. So I tried bots, I tried automation, I even created like some random bot programs to like move your mouse and auto follow people. And everything just went so bad. You couldn't grow anything more than a couple hundred followers and nothing was targeted, right? But when I started sharing what I love doing, I found other people who shared the same thing. So I started just leaning more into that. And I think once you find your one thing and you're passionate about it and you find other people who want that same type of art or creativity or whatever you're posting about, once you find that group of people and you lean into them and you just consistently do it, not only is it going to be good for your community and the followers that you're building, but it's also beneficial on the algorithm side and to get Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, whatever it is you're building on your side as well, because they know how focused you are on that particular subject. They're going to push you in that particular subject. If you're trying to do 10 things at once on Instagram, it doesn't know where to send your content. So it sort of like pushes you all over the place. So the more focused and dialed in you can be um, with picking your niche or picking your market, the better off you're going to be. 
what would you say is your one thing that you picked again for those people who may not know, like keyword wise? So when I started out as UX UI, um, because that was the job I was building with the startup, I was creating on the front end for it. So I just started sharing UI, UX, and then that slowly evolved into um, educational tips around UX UI and then morphed into more educational tips on growing. So I kept pivoting my lane, but once I did, I'd stick in that particular thing um, for as long as I could, right? But it definitely started out as a UX UI play. And I think there is a huge nugget where people get tripped up because, man, I talked to thousands of creatives in a year. They're scared to pick a lane for a season. They feel like if I niche down, I'm pigeonholed for the rest of my life. It's a life sentence. And it's literally a season like, hey, in the season is arbitrary, however long it is to you until maybe you find the next thing that sticks. So you realize, ah, fuck it, I don't really want to do this anymore. But you can pivot from lane to lane instead yeah. of trying to be on a 10 lane highway. Maybe you're just switching a lane from that interstate. You know, here's all my one single lane right here. I'm going hard in the paint in this one lane. Yep. And when you go hard, your audience is going to know what you're talking about. You're, you're not losing them by talking about, you know, crypto one day and then design the next and then money the next day. You're not juggling back and forth. So people get a deeper connection with you. So the deeper you go, the more ingrained they are with your story and your vision and your creativity, right? And that's how they start following in love. And that's how you start building that following in those super fans. Man, absolutely. 100%. What I preach to my students Instead of casting a wide net, yep, go deeper, yep, which will then ripple out wider. Well, I because think this you have to, Seth Godin's this is marketing. I'm pretty sure, just like don't cast a wide net. You have to build that critical mass. You have to not only do it for the fans and build in that one channel, but like once you get Instagram on your side and they know you for that one thing, then you could start layering in these other pieces. You do it through stories, through DMs, through behind the scenes stuff. And then over time, as people fall in love with like your crypto and NFT stuff, they could start seeing your drawing. They could start seeing your behind the scenes, your family, your entrepreneurship, your side hustle, right? You're layering in this stuff after you hit critical mass. And I think the most important thing is the catalyst of what it all stems from is sharing what you love doing versus what you think people want. Yep. And I think people are missing that. They're like, I think this is the trend over here. This is what Steve is. Steve's doing this and Sky's doing this and it's working for them. So I need to do that too. And I could even get wrapped up because I've been behind the scenes trying to reinvent myself as here's the coaching path. But also there's still this artist identity. How do I blend the world still? But yes, I'm also like the crypto and NFT yeah. junkie, you know? So behind the scenes, I'm slowly morphing this into the one thing. And it's, it's yep. defeating when you don't know what your one thing is for people. So what kind of tips or advice would you uh, give to people who haven't found what sticks or clicks yet? Because I found what clicked, yeah. but now I'm like refining what clicks through the lens of Instagram, but it's working behind the scenes. Well, it's going to change. You're going to grow, right? That's that. This evolution is natural. It's only not when I started out. It was UX Steven. So I I pigeonholed myself into UX, and I'm like, wait a second. Uh, I built forty thousand followers. How do I switch out of this? How do I change this? Made the pivot, but it's like I didn't want to be that personal brand. And you can always try new things. You can go down this path for a certain period of time, and if it's not working out, there's no shame in pivoting and like elevating to where you want to go, right? and just start talking about that thing. But you have to be sort of committed to that. You can't be doing it for like one day or one week. You have to stay committed for a few months and see if that is your one thing, right? So Try a, minimum a bunch of stuff, right see if there, it sticks. A minimum right there is like, if you're interested in something, going all in, give it what? Like a minimum of six months? I mean, it deserves time to nurture. It does, it does. And you can't maybe, give it a month and be like, shit, it didn't work out for me. Maybe it's the seasons too, like you talked about. It's it's just not your season for that thing right now. You may love it, but it may not be hitting on Instagram. It may not be trending. You know, if you're just chasing, and that's the other part I wanted to come back to, if you're just chasing trends and trying to be all about the trends, you're not building any depth. You know what I mean? So people jump on trending audios, trending videos, trying to build their personal brand. It's like, you're not showing any substance here. So pick the one thing, be true to yourself, and you'll find other people in that space who love what you're doing, who want to pay for what you're doing, but you have to give it time to sort of breathe and grow. And, you know, six months, sure. But if don't give up on it after two weeks. Right. Like I went into the mindset of blogging in 2015. Like I'm going to blog weekly for two years and see what happens. It yeah. evolved into public speaking and podcasting. Then I started the podcast. I'm like, I'm going to podcast weekly back in August. 19, 2016. 
I'm going to podcast weekly for minimum of two years and see what happens. Yeah. led to coaching. Yep. And it's funny. So I heard, I always toss out Gary V quotes because I heard him say this. It's like, don't sell to your audience right away. Try to build it. Try to go in for like two years. Right. So in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm doing UX UI. I'm going to stick with this Instagram stuff. I'm going to just post what I like. Let's see if I can do this for a year or two. Yeah. It pivoted a little to sharing, you know, how to educational tips, but I did that for two years straight to grow my audience. I didn't get disappointed when I didn't have a hundred thousand followers in two weeks or two months right? You stick with it and slowly it starts creeping up and snowballing and getting bigger and bigger. And then you finally start enjoying it because you're getting that ROI on it. And those people that you've nurtured, no like, and trust, no like, and trust, they're going to end up telling you what they want or need versus like going into it and be like, Hey, I have a product idea. I am going to make this and then go find the audience and build the audience versus I'm going to go and nurture, build, really connect with people on a deeper level, understand what their biggest dreams, fears, and struggles are, and then serve them. Mm -hmm. People, people don't get that. They're, they, they lack the big picture. They lack the slow and steady grind and the delayed gratification. If you have a personal brand, if you have, if you are building any sort of side hustle, right? Take flocked. I saw uh, something that annoyed me with writing captions on Instagram. You couldn't put the space in. I saw other people doing it with apps and they wanted $10 an app or they wanted some crappy website service. I'm like, I'll just build one. I made it for me, solved my problem, put it out there, told people I was using it. It ended up getting 100,000 users in a year. I'm like, that's pretty dope. So you have a personal brand, you have an audience. If you know their pain points, you can just make products and services that match their pain points that you use as well, or like that solve issues in your field. And you already have the microphone out there to all these people. So build your personal brand and it will generate infinite products for you. So from yours, what's like your value proposition then from the social media growth side, you understand that your audience struggles with this, this, and this, and your content is the solution, which now you have products that you can, let's even talk about your first um, official product and the launching of this product yep. and what's transpired, you know, leading me up to it. Cause I think it's pretty fascinating. So with picking a product and, and the whole reason behind growth is people are like, Oh, it's just a vanity metric. It's just a vanity metric. You're just growing a big number. It doesn't really mean much, but it's social proof, more, social proof. It, it's so much more than that. It's if you have this audience, you have this network, like I was just touching on, you have instant distribution. So if I'm building a startup and I walk out and I have 150,000 followers, I can go, hey, come build with me. I'm building this new thing for, you know, NFTs and NFT, you know, marketplace, right? If I just took the last two years and built my audience up in crypto and NFT, when I launch that, that's going to get instant credibility, instant buzz. It's going to drive so many more users there. You can then take that social proof to investors to get money. You don't need to monetize your existing audience and go, hey, go buy my product. I need to make money. You could use your audience to then go sell investors to get fundraising for your new platform. And if I did this with Flocked, uh, I built the Instagram space, right? I built this caption tool. If I add a few more layers onto this and add, I don't know, caption templates and an AI sort of copy.ai type of thing and build in this AI level to it, now I have audience who is passionate about my thing. I can go in turn and start charging monthly for this. And from my 150,000 followers, could I convert 1% of those over to use my Instagram caption tool? Probably into paying customers. That's a $10,000, $20,000 a month app right off the bat. So the two years building my social media following and, and launching a product through that, it's a no-brainer to me. What I find fascinating is that 150 k right now, can you speak yep. 165 at the moment? Can you speak towards the slow scale of like it started here, got to 65, then pivoted, changed a different lane, scaled even more yep. to where you're at today, to where you really, I think you found what's clicking for you, especially with like the um, drawing sketch reels. Yep. So real quickly, when I first started in April, 2019, I had a good run for about two months and I grew from like, 800 followers all the way up until 8,000. And then I got shadow banned. And people are like, well, shadow ban is not real. No, it is absolutely real. If you go check Social Blade and look at the analytics, you could see that there's a point where I had zero growth all through the summer of 2019. And I shared, I think it was a graphic that they, they deemed harmful, whatever. So shadow banned. And that sort of crushed me for the summer. I almost gave up on growing. Then in September, I was at about 10,000. 
And from 10,000 10, to, you know, December, I put on about another 30,000. So it was at 40,000 year one. And I think the biggest part with that initial launching point was you have to be brutally consistent, post every single day, connect with everybody you can get in there and, you know, engage with everybody, send DMs, reply, produce good content, soak up other people's content. That's the critical point that you have to get through. And once you start getting momentum and people start seeing that you're consistent, you're showing up, you're providing value, then it just takes off like wildfire because people want to share other people who are doing good for their industry, right? It's like the whole law of reciprocity. If you put out all this good energy and you share it and provide for this community, they're going to support you and provide back. And that's that critical mass that you have to build up and get to. So where you're at right now, launching your first product, you know, I didn't realize like you only made the jump to self-employment recently because you been building your brand. I think that's the most powerful thing. Like early on before I started saying like, yo, this is just a side hustle. And then people started coming to me for side hustle questions. Everybody thought I did when I was once perspective collective and just like the art and design lane, totally focused. <clears throat> Everybody thought like that was my full-time job as a freelancer. So from you, that was the outside looking in you positioned yourself as a go-to source in one lane. How has that been about building your personal brand? Like the power in that, why it's the most powerful asset. And then leading up to the jump point, taking the full-time leap, you know, having a second kiddo back against the wall. Cause we have very similar yep. kind of scary driven by fear to succeed in a sense. <laughs> Almost maniacal. So I think the whole time I had this allure of having the social media following. I didn't really know what it was when I first started um, or, or the power behind it. When I first started, I was like, Oh, I'll just build SaaS products. And, and that's where I'll get, you know, that's where I'll have, the most money, most you know, career wealth, et cetera. Um, but it was always working Chasing for the other cheddar. people. Yeah, always working for other people. And that potential payoff in a startup, I think, was the allure initially. And you get equity, you get shares. But what they don't tell you is the, the pathway to realization for that equity is 10 years down the road. And you don't know if it's going to, like, that's a big bet you could place on yourself, especially somebody who's 38, 37 at the time going through this with one kid at home, another kid on the way, I'm like, I can't make that risky bet in a startup, right? Usually at this time, you're more secure. You have your corporate nine to five job that is very secure. You're, you, you have that position for a while, um, but I didn't have that. So I was betting on startups and I was sort of making this play and doing this side hustle thing on the side and, and building apps. And I'm like, man, let me just lean into this audience thing. And then once I realized the power behind that and the leverage behind that, and committed to doing this. And I built this brand, I think, doing all my Instagram stuff, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., right? The true, true side hustle stuff did the startup during the day. But once I realized the power behind it, it's like, it's a no-brainer to make that jump. Now, the cash flow wasn't there because I hadn't released really any products yet. But just betting on yourself, knowing you put in the work over two years and knowing you built this audience and nurtured them, and like you built your name up and reputation, I'm going to bet on myself to make a product work. Like the reciprocity loop has been open yeah. and people are willing to close yeah. up those no like and trust. Yeah. You deserve a yeah. sell. Well, it's not even just like I'm gonna provide them with I'm gonna put all my I, I can into this product and make sure it's a good product and give and teach everything that I've learned over the last two years and how they can do this for themselves too. So I know the information is good. I've done it, I've seen other people do it. I've coached people that have, you know, one guy, the dad vibes, built his audience just off my free content from zero followers to a hundred, I think he's at 120,000 right now. And he did that in 11 months, just off my free content. So I'm like, I know, I know the proof is in the pudding, right? As they say, but let me just package this up and fast track people. And that's what I do with my course. So before you made that leap and bet big on yourself, did you have any type of runway, like six months of expenses or anything built up? A yeah, lot of people so were just like, I'm tired of my job. I'm going to go follow my passion. Yeah. Like, have you checked any of these boxes real quick? And is there a demand what you're doing? Do you have a runway? You know, like, have you thought about any of this? Do you have a plan? Yeah. So definitely make sure you have a runway. I made sure I had about six months. And honestly, I wish I had a little bit more um, because it, it did come down to the wire. And I definitely delayed it with a new newborn in the house. He was just born uh, three weeks later. I quit my job. So um, it was a bit intense, but it was the right move. And 
I think it's paying off now because like I said, make sure you have your runway saved up, make sure you know, sort of, you have line of sight to revenue, whatever that's going to be. If that's freelance, if that's, it make sure you can generate, you know, revenue. I had people offering me jobs and I'm like, you know, I really want to focus on this. I want to focus on sort of my products and my personal thing. We'll get back to this. Right. So the opportunities were there. Like I could probably go out and find another job. I just didn't want, I wanted to lean all into my personal brand, if that makes sense. So like when I lost my job, super scary, as I mentioned to you too, knew we were expecting close on a new house, boom, rug pulled. Yep. And I, after I just got a raise in a, uh, a position of a UI UX senior designer. I'm like, Oh yeah, life is good. I'm promised a safe job. I'm, we were attacking, uh, attacking debt, like hardcore. And it got to the point where once I got fired, like first two weeks, I was just like recreating portfolios for scratch. Like I didn't even give myself the time or day to think I could make the full time. leave. I'm like, it's probably two years out there. I still got debt to pay off. And it was my wife who was just like, this is, this is time you haven't been putting all this work for five and a half years under perspective collective. And then just grinding on the side, t-shirt companies, slanging tattoos, slanging everything under the sun, uh, outside of college. And she was like, you can always get another day job, but if you don't like bet big on yourself now, you'd regret See, that. Huge. And I'm that's like, huge. she was the one I was thinking she was wanting me to play the safe route. And yeah. she's like, you haven't been doing this for no reason. You can always get a new day job. You can always get one. But like, I'm like, oh my God, there it was. There it was. <laughs> and like, we just paid off Here's a ton pivot. of debt. I just had proof of product, like a coaching program that first launched. I built a runway, had a severance package for a little bit longer. So I think that's the powerful thing is building the runway, building the audience, understanding where your demand is, your unique voice, value yep. proposition, all of that lined up for you. So um, talk about your product right now. Like this wasn't even supposed to have you on to come shill your product. This is me like, I've gotten a lot of value from your Instagram and I think it's fascinating. You bet big on yourself and here's your first product. I appreciate that. So it's it's definitely interesting and exciting betting on yourself and going big, right? It's It's that scary, that risk taker that you want to sort of prove yourself in the market, right? And see if it pays off. But this product essentially is just me taking the collective of the last three years. You know, I have my degrees in marketing, design, whatever, but it's really just the true stuff, the tactical stuff that you need to grow. Um, it cuts out a lot of the fluff. I think I, you know, did jump cut the whole way through it. So it's very condensed. Each lesson's like seven minutes or five minutes. Um, so it's not these long winded stuff. Um, or, it's called the Graham Accelerator. That, yeah, and it gets you sort of into the product, gets you moving, takes you through building, creating content, um, growing your following, and then monetizing at the end. Yeah, so it's nice. It's, it's a nice little package. So for anybody who is uh, watching the YouTube, I'm kind of just scrolling through the, the landing page right now. How long did it take you to create something like this behind the scenes, knowing like, I got to plan my escape, plan my escape? <laughs> And so, I gotta drop this like damn 16 lessons, 11, 17, 11, 50 I've had, lessons, dude. This thing is packed. I've had this idea in my head to launch <laughs> this type of product because I've seen the other products out there, no shade on them, but they talk a lot of theory and they don't teach sort of tactics. I got the best bang for my buck in courses when somebody has said, here, do this and then do this. You know, they take you through step by step and show you the how to's. And that's what I wanted to build this product as even when I, you know, I think it was 2020, right when the pandemic hit. Okay, we're going to launch a course. We're going to do this. I'm going to teach this. It just took me a year to put it all, year plus to put it all together and it packaged up. And the catalyst was saying, okay, well, I have to leave my startup and I have to do this full time. There's no other options. I have to take this better myself. I have to, you know, take on a little risk. And I knew I had the six month runway. So putting that together, it's like, it was a collective of like six months. But now that I know the process, now that I know how to record these tutorials and, and put out these courses, you could probably do it in like two months, you know, but it, it took me six months. It took me a lot of, you know, procrastination, imposter syndrome, getting through those like, oh, is this going to be good enough? Am I recording this? Is the lighting right? Is the camera good? You know, how are these, how am I talking about it? What's perfection? You know, am when I, I keeping my people? First, it's brutal. When I made my first coach or a course, my video, video course last year, man, I was way too precious about yep. him. It was like the hardest thing I had ever done. It was scary as hell. It was difficult. 
and now like now that it's out there once i got into a flow of recording this and i got a little bit of that feedback that little bit of people who got through the first two modules like oh my god this is more like when are you adding more i'm like oh all right this is it this is the formula so now i'm just ripping off these lessons i could sit down and do like five lessons in a day i'm like this is great now i have the formula down now i've taken that risk i've taken that leap so the timeline is going to be shorter next course I release or next product I release, which is, it's well, so, and I, and, so cool. And you're wired like me. So now you're listening to what everybody is saying or wishing they would have seen differently or what's the next steps from here. And so from here, you're already planning out, okay, here's the next five potential opportunities to serve these people based on what they're saying this potentially is missing or what they need next after this. You know, it's, yeah. what is it? A uh, list, uh, listen, um, act and then serve something like that. Yeah. It's like, that's kind of like the loop that I've always been, you know, listen to what people want, yep. create something that's for it and that serves them. And exactly. then it slowly like, scales over time, whether it's a lead magnet or a piece of content to a small MVP product to then a course. And I'm sure you think the same way We we like to get into our products and, and get going quick and make, you know, launch quick, edit quick, produce, edit, publish, you know, just get into it. And a lot of the courses out there, like I said, I'm not trashing on them, but I don't learn like that. I learn, you know, tactically. I learn if you show me A, how to do A to get to B, I can do that. I can replicate that. And so like now I'm seeing all these gaps with people who learn just like I do. And I'm like, well, crap, I can make this. And that's what I wanted to learn two years ago. And I bought all these courses and I didn't get it. Now I'm going to start applying that to other things in other areas. I'm like, okay, well, this is, uh, let's make an NFT course of how to tactically go through and launch NFTs, right? It's like, we can rip this course over in 45 minutes in an hour and then publish it. It's like, you can start tackling these things once you figure out the formula. We're visual learners. Cause you have uh, that. I, I always originally thought and saw you as like heavy on the left brain, logic, coding, all that, you know, behind the weeds. Then I start seeing you like doing these sketch things. I'm like, oh no, he's, he's a creative too. You yeah. know, so you're a visual guy like me. That's, that's I, learned how I learned so visually. Yep. It's yeah, my mind, here's a bunch of data and numbers and go read 17 blog posts. Like I under I, I appreciate the data. I like the data. I like seeing sort of MPIs, but I don't live in that world. I like to mix sort of the creative stuff with the nerdy metrics. And once you mesh those two together, you find a formula. And it's like people are resonating with that because you have some people who really are high visual learners and they could learn just by my sketch, you know, my sketch reels, which are blowing up on TikTok for some reason, by the way. It's like you get these sketch reels and yeah, they're, I don't have to put my face on them. I get to use my hands and manually draw and sketch out some topics and teach people along the way. And like, I grew up drawing. So I like doing that sort of art, that medium and teaching along the way. It's the best of both worlds. I think that's a powerful thing too. It's like connect with all the weird stuff that you liked growing up. That is going to help you find your groove now too. Like all the weird shit that I loved growing up drawing and aliens and cats and pizza. That's like all the <laughs> stuff that now shows up in my work it's now so that helps people connect. I guess like it, it builds a bridge easier for people to kind of like see themselves in me. Um, yep. One thing you had talked about um, that you got roasted on recently was that your boss won't pay you enough to live next door. To him. <laughs> and yes. And I want yep. to preface this is that you and I are definitely not everyone's cup of tea. And I think <laughs> anybody listening, when you start sharing the work that you love building an audience, just first accept that like, you're not pizza. You can't please everyone, you know, yep. and, and you can't be everyone's cup of tea, but you can be someone's go-to slice of pizza. See, like all the love of pizza stuff just comes in here, yep. but we dish out tough love dose of reality, but then we layer on encouragement and more specifically action steps baked into it. So can you go into, you know, this topic of your boss won't pay you enough to live next door to him. Where is that stemming from? And why do you think people get butthurt about it? Oh, this is going to be a good one. So sitting in like 2018, we're sitting in an office with my buddy who was, you know, one of the co-founders and he was talking about, well, there's only one way to do things or that you have to do it this way. You have to do it this way. You have to do it this way. And I'm like, speaking oh. an absolute I'm like, blanket statement. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm like, I respect your opinion, but no, there, I'm going to do it my way. And this is how I do it. Right. And the whole time of like people telling you, you have to fit in this bucket, you have to fit in this bubble. And your only position there is to help them further their objectives. And it sounds cr cruel and rude to say it that way. But when you think about it in hierarchy, they have you in a position to help them get to 
X, Y, and Z. They don't care if it's you. If you leave, they'll find somebody else to replace you. So they're never going to want to see you, you know, outshine your master. They never want to see you level up above them because it means you have something that they don't have. And it's sort of this power struggle. So like the whole quote behind your boss will never pay you enough to live next to them. It's hierarchy, right? And I like breaking that mold. I like being sort of, it's, I don't do it on purpose, but I rub people the wrong way. I go against the grain with everything I do. And it's the competitiveness in me that I want to this make sure that- This is the traditional I, way of how it's always been done? Right. Like, no, Watch no, me. we'll do it different. Right. Nope. Exactly. Same. It's the whole, you're going to prove them wrong no matter what. Tell me I can't do it and I'll prove you wrong. Right. So that's the whole mentality behind it. And people, I think, caught it wrong or caught some shade from it because- they like, they're like, oh, well, not entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. I like to work my job. My boss is great, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, the, but get behind the layers. Like, why is he great? Are you, you going to be great to him when you have your side hustle? And then he thinks you're getting your cheddar somewhere else and you're not going to be better for him. And then he, his feelings are going to get butt hurt. See how he reacts then, right? So like, if you stay in that box, sure. You know, you may be a great employee. You may be the right hand man to him. You may be, you know, number one B or two, but you're never going to be that king position because there's a lot of ego at play. So I don't know. I just like breaking those barriers and going against the grain. Well, one, there's nothing wrong with having a day job. In fact, like the yeah. whole motto of my coaching programs, like for the beginner intermediate people is leverage your day job to fuel your dream job yes. kind of about the, the art of stealing from your day job skills assets trainings going to yep. conferences that's beautiful but if you're like us and you crave something more and you understand how this traditional system was built to train factory workers as you said to be good little worker bees you realize hey i am being trained to do this job to build someone else's dream and put yep. mine on the back burner which is okay because once i'm in my 60s and retired then I get to live out my dream. I'm like, Ooh, that just doesn't settle well with me. No. Like it, it, I see it in my parents, I see it in my yep. in-laws, I see it in my siblings. And that just never sat right with me. Cause I was fed that in college. Like, okay, here's the path. Get, yep. go to college, get balls deep in debt <laughs> and go yep. get a good paying job. That's safe. I had the safe job, then get a mortgage, get married, have kiddos, grind, save, save, save. Yeah. And a bank account that gets you like 0.025% interest. <laughs> and I'm like, it's, no, none, of this, none like, of this sits right with me. It, and like you said, it's, it's perfectly fine to have that day job. And like, I like to leverage that where you can, right? If you could work 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. on your own stuff, and That's it's the not word. affecting leverage. Yeah. And you, it's not affecting your day job. You're still producing, you're still, you know, showing up every day, then do it. You may have some bosses who absolutely hate that, right? It, but it all depends on sort of where you want to position yourself. If you realize that you have something greater inside you, then why are you just working for somebody who can't help you level up or doesn't want to see you truly level up, right? If that boss was truly a fan of yours, they would say, no, go out. You're better off doing this thing. You're my best employee, but it's clear that you have a position outside this company that you want to go to and that you're gifted and that you should be doing instead of this. But who, what bosses are going to tell you that there's not many that I've seen or come across. Right. Like I was lucky to have a core team around that, but it was a more corporate play. Like yeah. my supervisor was like all for it. Cause what I learned on the outside ended up benefiting the core team. Yeah. But then from the higher ups who didn't have any insight to what we're doing, they're the ones who rug pulled us. They, but, they get selfish. And yep. Like, it's, it's, it was a money thing. It was totally like, Oh, tailwinds are coming. Let's where can we cut people? Yep. Let's cut the marketing department. Yep. So, I mean, they just a number. At, they look at it in pawn. terms of, of money. Okay, they're paying you this salary. You should be doing this for them full-time. And well, what's full-time? Do you own my hours at home? Do you own my hours 9 p.m. to 1 a.m.? No, I'm sacrificing sleep so I could build this for myself. You know? And Jim Rohn is one of my favorite guys to go to. And he said this too. He's like, work harder on yourself than you do in your job. It's so true. Like you should really. Your success in life rather exceeds your level of personal development. It's you have to lean into yourself. You have to lean into what makes you, you. I mean, I don't know. That's just sort of been my motto the whole time too. 
So something else you talked about, I hope this is okay to bring up, but you talked about how a fire was lit into you a while back. Uh, the passing yes. of your mom. Yes. And I'd like to take it from the angle of some people just like crave more. They see a different life from themselves. It's like they're seeking an external permission slip to bet big on themselves. They're seeking validation, but they're missing like the spark, the desire, the goal, something to just give them a reason to show up, push that shit and just be driven. You know, can you speak toward how a fire was lit in you and where it's at today and maybe how other people can seek internally or externally to find that fire? Sure. So one, I've never talked about this, but two, thank you for pulling it out. Um, I hope that's okay, man. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So like, this is, this is going to be cool. So my mother passed in 20, 2001. Um, I was 18, my first year of college. Right. But I was just, you know, going through life and not really affected. I was just playing sports after work, going to a job and that was it. Like I didn't have any. Yeah. And I probably did that for a couple of years after she passed. And like 20, 2005, I keep saying 20, but 2005, I was like, okay, well, this is bullshit. Like there, there has to be more to this. But what I meant with that quote was, I didn't know what I was doing. And for some reason, after she passed, I mentally flipped. And I remember going to my first year of college after she passed and like dyed my hair blonde. Eminem was big then. I'm like, whatever, never did that before. Never was eccentric, never stood out. And I was like, okay, well, this is just me now. And like, I wore my hat with a little bit of twist and like people would ask him like, "Ah, that's because I want to. And for whatever it was, (laughs) it was just like this little switch that kicked off. And I'm like, nope, I'm just going to start doing me. And that's the fire. It's like, whatever she passed on was, nope, just do you don't care what anybody else says. And that's where that little, you know, going against the grain sort of starting like, festering and growing into the, the this fire is like i'm gonna do me i don't care what people say i'm gonna produce this because i like it and it's just caught hold ever since how does that reflect in what you're doing now in your message to your following mm-hmm. people who are craving to build personal brands and leverage social media to grow do what you want don't do it because it's trendy so you want to post something post something you know dial into what you want to post try a bunch of a bunch of things, but you have to find what's passionate for you and what really lights your fire and share that with the world. People need to hear it and people need to see it. Now you have a unique perspective with what you want to share. You just have to lean into that and trust yourself. Don't be, don't hedge on like, well, I don't know if I should share that. I don't know if I should put that out. That's not good enough. All this imposter syndrome, like you're never going to get to where you want to be unless you start putting yourself out there. like, you make all these mistakes. You start saying, well, fuck it. I could do this right? If you start pushing and leaning into that, that little voice more, it becomes a bigger voice. And then you start realizing you get momentum on your back and you really find a community of people who like what you're putting out there and start vibing with you. And that's where you'll start, you know, getting the most bang for your buck. So I'm like totally a recovering people pleaser, like grew up hardcore bully. Yep. So I realized connecting dots, man, I was always just craving acceptance and I wanted acceptance in my art. Like I was a closet artist till I was like 21, dude, didn't share with anyone. Yep. And like the first two years of me starting my brand, you know, and I got, uh, started like uh, blogging, you know, did the early stages of the podcast and got to do public speaking the first two years. I didn't swear. I was so scared to offend anyone. I'm like, dude, I have a sailor mouth, you know, from football and sports Mm -hmm. and everything. Swear. You know, that's just, that's part of the brand. It probably turns off a lot. I've had people literally DM me like, I think you need to know my opinion because I'm not following anymore because you said (laughs) shit in your Instagram caption. But now I'm realizing Instagram's like, calling that not safe for work content or whatever, oh like harmful gosh. stuff. Cause you said that I'm like, Oh, no wonder why my reach is radically declined. I got bored of the game. everybody. Yeah. yeah. But I'm like, that was a really, really hard thing for me. And it still is at times to not care what people think. That's something I'm still working on. It's gotten better, but it's, it's so it's tough a very to, tough pill to swallow. It's tough to get over that. Like, I have no idea why I dyed my hair blonde and, and went to an actual college class like that. No idea. For, for, for some reason, I'm just like, fuck it. You know, it, it was a switch and I didn't know what it was back then. But now the more I like look into this and start realizing, it's like, no, it's that attitude. It's that fire. It's like, you're not there to please everybody. 
there's going to be people who don't like you, who don't like the way you, you know, go about your business, but you're not for them, right? It's, you just have to lean into that and accept that, right? You're being nice and you're being courteous, but you know, some people just aren't for you and they're not going to like you or they're not going to follow you because you swear on your podcast or swear on your Instagram page. And I know like some people were calling me out for like posting clickbait and like, oh, that's clickbait. You know, your boss, that's the whole, you're, you'll never, your boss will never pay you enough to live next to them. It's like, that's what I feel. That's what I truly believe is that I've worked for bosses and they really don't want to see you level up. They want that position of authority, that control, well, that alpha, my first, alpha my mentality. First big boy job. Like the yeah. dude would scavenge all over my sites, asking me to take down freelance work. Like saw a tweet one day, but like, I can't wait to be a full-time freelancer one day. I thought that's the route I wanted to go. He was spying on all my shit and he was oh, not that's... having me do that. You know, like, and then I just leveraged all the time outside of it. I crushed everything for him so I could build a portfolio. I snuck all my work off and built a portfolio and landed my next big boy job. You know, you leverage go. that day job to fuel the next day job, which then sprung my side hustle. And like the day job for me, like even I worked at GE for about 10 years before I started doing this. Um, and then I worked at another, you know, private company and then two different startups. Right. But it's like you use that, that initial nine to five to fuel and satisfy like your mortgage payments, satisfy your rent, satisfy all the, all your bills that you have to do. Like we have family, we have to pay bills. We have to, you know, support them, but do that to a point where it's okay to flip that switch and bet on yourself and use that, those hours and sacrifice your sleep. You know, I, like I said, 9 PM to 1 AM, I probably haven't gone to bed at the same time as my wife in the last three or four years, but it's like, I'm not just playing video games and, you know, fooling around. I'm actually working on bettering myself, bettering my business, bettering my personal brand, creating content, like all this stuff that I enjoy doing is done after hours. How mine was mine was early mornings. Early mornings was my grind time because everything was yeah. writing. I'm like, my brain is just fried at the end of the day, trying yep. to like outline episodes or sales pages or copy for email marketing. Yep. It was early fried. morning lunch breaks, two 10 minute breaks. Then a little bit, once I put the kiddo down for bed, you know, my yep. wife, he's watching the TV. I'd, I'd grind and do my artwork. And it, it, you brought up an important part right there. It's you have to find these little pockets of time and sort of structure your day to where you can build your following, right? You're going to get lunch. You're going to pick up lunch at Chipotle, jump on, respond to 10 people in the DMs, right? You're waiting in line to pick it up. You're waiting for them to, you know, to make your food, respond to a couple of DMs, start outlining your content for the next night that you're going to be able to create. You know, I did everything in outline on notes and built all my carousels because I think I did a carousel a day, but everything was done in notes at lunch, right? I'd go off, I'd get my food. It'd take me 10 minutes to sort of write this outline down. And I'm like, okay, cool. We're good. It's funny. People right. say they want it, but they'd rather just talk a big game. Cause then when it comes down to it, I'm like, you'd rather just scroll mindlessly yeah. consume trash, go home and play video games or watch people play video games when I'm over here investing in video games, yep. you know, like you can't talk about it. You can't complain that you're only getting like 70% results when you haven't given it 110% effort. The, the biggest hack that I had, so I have personal Instagram accounts, I have personal uh, Twitter accounts, and I have business ones, which is you know my personal brand, the Steve Miller. It's biggest thing I did was I removed those personal accounts from login. So like when I opened up Instagram, it was only the personal brand. When I opened up Twitter, it was only the personal brand. And I actually deleted those accounts off the phone. So whenever I opened it up, I wasn't tempted to go back and start engaging with friends and all the other stuff that I follow, like sports, whatever. It's like, no, it's only focusing on what you're doing at that time for that business. I think to be successful doing your thing, whether it's a side hustle, you love your day job, you just want to build your brand over here as a side hustle, or you want the entrepreneur route as we've taken. I think it overall boils down to mindsets, personal mm -hmm. development, and then self-management disciplines, habits, routines, processes, systems, knowing when to delegate, eliminate, as well as, the project, the time management, everything. Like there's so many different hats into what we do. Yeah. And it takes a special kind of crazy to be hungry to do it. And most people just don't have the spark. They're lacking something to be excited about, to roll out of bed, put their 10 little tootsies on the floorboards and just start making plays and making moves in their own lane. It's just, I don't know if it's something you can teach or if ambition is something you can teach. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you can nurture, but I don't know if you can yeah. just tell someone like, this is why you should be fired up today. 
Yeah, like listening to David Goggins every day getting you out of bed, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, I it's true. I just swear at you or Gary V <laughs> swear at you all day. Make, make that your alarm. I mean, no, that would but, work for me, though. It, I like it, that so, style. It, same here, same here. But I think like, I think you mentioned that the productivity, the the little growth hacks, the little, we could almost make a course on this, like the little things you need to do to train yourself. Like putting my 10 by two, the 10 people I want to engage with every day into my notes, making their URLs clickable. So when I have to engage with people, it's like, okay, well, this is only going to take me 10 minutes. Let me just open it up. Let me set a reminder to tell me when I'm at lunch to go, you know, respond to these yeah, people. I put Siri to work over yeah, here. Yeah, right? all these, all these <laughs> little best tricks. Employee. You could literally make a productivity AI bot, like you said, like Siri, and come back and just have you get nudged and notified every time you need to do a certain action. But built like knowing what to build and knowing how to create those little triggers to get you that little reward um, and, and just staying consistent with it, right? What a um, big fan of James Clear and yes. Atomic Habits, and he talks about habit stacking. I'm like, yep. dude, that's that's like the ultimate hack. It knowing yourself mind. and finding what works best for you. Like I was an early riser. You're a late night owl. Mm-hmm. I give hacks and tips all the time for time management, project management, prioritization, focus. But it's all at the end of the day, finding what works best for you. But you got to make an attempt and stick with it. What were you about to say? You do. Well, I was going to say like the, the James Clear book it blew my mind with the 1% better each day. Yeah. Right. That's the like compounding a staple interest behind it. Oh my students. goodness. They're like, I want instant overnight results. I'm like, yo, this program 12 weeks is intense and it's a 1% each week kind of thing. And it compounds, compounds. You have to like stay committed to what you want to do and and stick to it long enough that you actually start, you know, enjoying it. it. It sounds weird, but you have to get through that sort of that annoying growth phase of like, okay, this sucks. That grind, right? The dog days of summer, as they say, it's like, you have to get through that part. Um, and then once you do, it's so rewarding after that. It's truly purposeful play in what you're yeah. doing, but because it's play, because it's fun, because of the buzzword passion, like that helps you show up when it's not convenient. And I'm, I'm a for self-care. I did the whole hardcore, no sleep, hustle, 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 grind, grind, grind yeah. early on. And I'm like, actually it's a, it's a slow and steady grind, you know, delayed yeah. gratification, but at least like showing up and maybe spending 15 minutes on your top task that day. Here's your main task for the week break it down. Here's your top tasks that lead to the main task. Even if it's only 15 minutes a day, because you are a mom who is a stay at home mom with five kiddos, you know, like but yep. 15 minutes a day for 30 days equals out to approximately like an eight hour work day. And people think you need that eight hour stretch to make big moves. I'm like, no, no, no s- small little sprints. So, it, and if we could bring this back to Instagram real quick, the whole premise behind growing on Instagram right now is people are telling you, you got to post five, six, seven times a day, make, you know, six reels a week, post all this content. You can still grow posting like once a day. It's just, you have to show up every day. You have to produce something <laughs> because not only is it good for you and for the algorithm and for your followers, but it, it like, it's especially good for you. It builds that habit muscle of showing up every single day, that habit. little 1% better, right? Exactly. And I, I feel like we could uh, keep rambling on and on. Clearly, we're going to need a round two for something yes. more dialed in and focused for people. So if you're listening and there's like, I want to know more about this topic, whether it be NFTs or social media growth, whatever it is, like, let us know. But um, as we land the plane here, where can people go to find you online, support you? And I'll type it all in the show notes. Yep. So all my socials, so Twitter, you know, Instagram, TikTok is the Stephen Miller. Um, or you can go to my website, stevemeller.com. And the Instagram course, I'll also have um, baked into the show notes. Well, Steve, dude, this was awesome. I really, really, really appreciate uh, appreciate your time. Like it was great to get to like talk to the individual behind all the content I've been pushing my students way over the last year and a half. So uh, thank you. And I can't wait to drop this on people. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for the time. All right, let's stay in touch. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.